This is Edward Downs, quiz master for Texaco's opera quiz. We're going to devote our quiz today entirely to Mozart and his operas, and I want to thank our listeners for the enormous interest they've shown in this program. We've received a perfect avalanche of questions asking about Mozart. It's only natural that many of them have been duplicates, and so we've paid careful attention to the postmarks of your letters, and in cases of duplication, we are using the one with the earliest postmark. Our panel today is made up of Mozart experts, all of them familiar personalities to you. First, we have a lady panelist, the well-known author, Marcia Davenport. Among Mrs. Davenport's many bestsellers is a biography of Mozart, and the proof of its attraction is that it has never been out of print since its publication in 1932. Then we have Jay Harrison, music critic and director of literary services of Columbia Records, who will add to his extracurricular activities by resuming after 11 years a music course on contemporary music at New York University. Boris Goldovsky is next. He is the founder and artistic director of the Goldovsky Opera Institute, whose major claim to fame on this particular Mozart panel is that he has conducted and produced no less than eight different Mozart operas in this country during the past 15 years. From the academic world, we have Sigmund Levery, professor of music history at Brooklyn College of the City University of New York, and an author too. One of his books is called A Critical Analysis of Mozart's Le Nozze di Figaro, The Marriage of Figaro. So welcome to our Mozart quiz, and here's our first question, which comes to us from Stanley Hoffman of Van Nuys, California. He writes, I have read that Mozart's Don Giovanni is not an Italian opera, nor is it a German opera. And his question is, how do you classify Don Giovanni? And is there any difference between the operas Mozart wrote to Italian texts and those he wrote to German texts? Now, who would like to crack this nut? Uh, Mr. Goldowski? Yes, there's a great difference. Uh, German opera was just beginning at that time in Vienna, and it was mostly on a very light touch, something that today we probably would call a musical comedies. While Italian operas were divided into series and comic operas, Don Giovanni is a comic opera with an Italian text with music by Mozart. I don't think it needs any more classification than that. Um, Mr. Harris. Well, there's one further thing. Mozart was very sensitive to languages. And the difference in the sound between the Italian language and the German language produced different kinds of music. So they really are two, you know, different things entirely. Dr. Levering. Mm. Uh, there is something special about Don Giovanni, because actually Italian operas in these days, as Mr. Goldowski said, were either called serious or buffa. Now Mozart very carefully calls Don Giovanni neither. It's not a serious opera, it's not a buffa opera, he calls it dramma giocoso. It means it is something special and was something special even to him. I think it certainly was something special. Mrs. Davenport, did you want to add something to that? Yes, the same thing uh, in another way. When he wrote to a German text, I think he wrote much... Uh, he wrote music differently, but he, he himself felt differently. And when he wrote uh, to an Italian text, he was expressing the whole sum total of his musical education. I think his German language, the operas he wrote to the German language, are in a sense more artless, more just completely off the top of his head. I have a feeling that they are less uh, deeply seasoned in the extraordinary musical education oh, that his father gave him. I think that uh, Mr. Goldowski is disagreeing oh, with you having on a that point. Yes, I'm having a fit. <laughs> I'm having a fit to hold that the magic flute has nothing but artless music, you know perfectly well. I Stop didn't say the magic flute had nothing but artless music. I'm thinking of Mozart's own personal comments and reactions to what he was doing while he was doing it. Think of his letters. Yes, and That's we're what speaking I mean. about his operas, Miss Davenport, not his letters, and the magic flute is full of the most extraordinarily uh, contrapuntal, miraculous of things, it as you is. know that better there than is I no do. Dis no, 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 no. But I, I still think that. Uh, <laughs> let's get to another question before we repeat ourselves. Well, it certainly is a combination. It has the most incredibly artless seeming melodies, folk tunes, and it has also incredible contrapuntal complications and so on. I think we could mine the riches in that opera for a long time. But let's go on to another question that comes from Stephen Brown of Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island. 
He writes this, it has been said that Mozart was no great operatic innovator, like Wagner or Gluck. Yet, being among the greatest of composers, he must have contributed something. Can the panel describe this specifically and pin down what Mozart's contribution was? Uh, Dr. Levery. Oh, I can refer to a short example that we just heard. The uh, traditional opera aria in Mozart's day, is, as we know, was the da capo aria. That means something was sung, and then there was some kind of a middle section, and then the singer sang the whole thing all over again. That is dramatically not very feasible. Now, remember Donna Elvira's first entrance. She sings her aria. Then in the middle section, we hear Don Giovanni in the background saying, poverina, poverina, which is really enough to set her off again. What makes it even more, more amazing is that she doesn't hear it, the audience does, but I think that is enough, and one rather willingly takes the da capo, which otherwise would be feeble. Yes. That's new. I mean, nobody had, I think, tried that, that that's before. New, uh, that's new in serious roles, I would say. Of course, in comic roles, they had used simpler aria forms before that. Mr. Goldowski? I think that the greatest innovation of Mozart was that, of course, he did everything that everybody else did, but incredibly better. You notice that when you want to produce um, opera of the 18th century, it has been my great privilege to produce, for instance, a, a fine, a very fine Paisiello opera. Mm -hmm. And it is very difficult for us to accept it because Mozart did everything that Paisiello did, but did it so enormously better. And if I could go to the piano for a moment, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, I <laughs> maybe I could show you very quickly that when Mozart wanted something unusual, he always found the most extraordinary ways of describing it. Now, Mr. Lever, yes. you, you, I see your hand. You talk while I go to the piano. <laughs> <laughs> I would also put in Mrs. that Danford. in the orchestration of Nozze di Figaro, he made some real innovations in what up to then was the orchestral part of opera composing. Nozze di Figaro has very distinct departures in terms of characterization and dramatization in the orchestration. Yes, I think Mr. Mr. So, yes. <coughs> Mr. Goldovsky, I'll make it very simple for you. It would be much more graceful. Will you play for us? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But before I play, now that Miss Davenport has spoken, I, I just want to add that really very much more exciting innovations in orchestration are not in the marriage of Figaro, but in Idomeneo, where there are several passages that really sound exactly like Berlioz. But I cannot illustrate it on the piano, of course. But what I would like to illustrate very quickly is that when Mozart wanted, for instance, to illustrate something completely metaphysical, completely abnormal. He would find means that were not later rediscovered until our century. So that, for instance, later in today's opera, when the commendatore, the statue, comes and describes uh, that uh, he doesn't eat mortal food because he is eating heavenly food. Mozart, in order to portray heavenly food, write something that was not attempted for another 120 years, maybe, and this is a non-repetitive role, which is very much akin to what 12-tone composers do today. And if I had more time, I could give you lots more examples, but I'm going back to my seat. <laughs> Mr. Harrison. There is one point. I don't, I don't really regard Mozart as that much of an innovator because it seems to me it's very simple to be an innovator. If I sat down today and wrote a concerto for kazoo and harpsichord, I would be an innovator, but I have no talent. Mozart didn't have to be an innovator. He, what he did was clearly based on talent, and those innovations that he made, well, that was par for the course. But the thing about Mozart, one doesn't say this was a man who revolutionized music. He didn't at all. Dr. Levery, uh, Mr. Harrison is right. Mozart didn't revolutionize, but he did something that I think nobody had attempted before in opera. He characterized people by the music they sang. Up to Mozart, I think, up to Gluck, let us say, which is more or less the same time, it, it was possible to interchange arias. I think in Mozart, it's, it's entirely impossible. M may I illustrate a point? Yes, yes, please do. <laughs> please do. <laughs> well, <laughs> Mrs. Davenport, did no, you want to... Oh, Mr. is ready Mr. now. Mr. No, Mr. Davenport. No, 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 we're waiting for you. <laughs> well, it's something else we just heard. Remember the, yeah, the, the uh, uh, scene in which the commendatore is slain. Uh, everybody sings something else. The commendatore is on his last breath. I'm just, just playing the vocal lines. <laughs> Uh, uh, Leporello is very much afraid. This is his line.
Now, Don Giovanni is also a little bit afraid. He's speaking of the old man who is lying on the floor dying. He's, he's not at all pleased by the situation. Now, what does he sing? You'll all recognize it because shortly before, Donna Anna had sung this phrase six times. And while Don Giovanni is, is pitying the old man whom, he's, whom he has just slain, he's singing this. means that while he has killed the man and is really shaken, a little bit shaken by it, he's really thinking of Donna Anna, whom he has just visited in her bedchamber. Now, this is new. I mean, I don't think anybody had tried to, to do this before. It's certainly a psychological subtlety that would be very rare, I think, in opera up to that time. And Mr. Harrison? You know, most people don't realize it, but we think of Don Giovanni, we know his character, we know his personality, we know everything about him. And yet he has only two short arias in the whole course of the opera. All of the rest of the characterization is done in, in ensembles. Yes, and yes. by other people by who other speak people. about him. It's Three, really... Mr. Harrison. Which is the third? I think the thing, the mandolin one and the uh, champagne arm. And then when he's getting Mazzetta off the stage. Yeah, 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 yeah. three. Well, but even then, to, to, to define a character in three arias is incredible. It certainly is. Uh, I have another question here that I'm sure Mrs. Davenport can answer as a friend of Toscanini who knew him well. Harold D. Griffin of St. Petersburg, Florida writes us this. I have heard that Toscanini disliked conducting Don Giovanni. Do the members of the panel know whether this is true? And if they do, do they know why? Uh, Mrs. Uh, Davenport? Yes. yes. Uh, it wasn't that he disliked conducting Don Giovanni. He disliked Don Giovanni. He honored it. He never uh, gave any uh, argument to the estimation of Don Giovanni in all its greatness and grandeur. He conceded this, and he often played the overture in concert. But he disliked the opera as an opera because he said it had two ugly arias in it, what he called brutta musica. One of them was Don Ottavio's Dalla Sua Pace, which mm -hmm. put Maestro into a fuming rage, and the other one was Don Anna's second act aria, Non Mi Dir Belli Dol Mio. He said this was brutta musica, unworthy of Mozart, and for this he would never play it on. Good the heavens, Dr. Levery. It's, it's worth mentioning that Mozart actually has not been very popular in Italy until recently. The history That's of Mozart, yes. the history of Mozart in Italy is very strange, mm -hmm. but I remember the very first performance of the abduction from the Seraglio in Italy, which was shortly before the Second World War under Bruno Walter. Now you'd think it, it could have gotten there a little sooner, but it didn't. <laughs> well, the exception, of course, is the Zauberflöte, which they insisted on giving in Italian as the Flauto Magico, and it's it's appalling in Italian, but it has often been given at the Scala all through its life. Yes. Uh, Mr. Downs, Mr. Am, am I wrong in assuming that Mozart wasn't terribly popular in America until fairly recently? I know that there was a long, long time that Mozart wasn't given at the Metropolitan. I think it came back with, with Pinza. I seem to remember this as being true. With the revival of the marriage of Figaro. Uh, Mrs. Davenport wants to answer in that, I guess. In a much earlier period, when there were just the singers for it, there was an enormous amount of Mozart given at the Metropolitan. Then, when, with the departure of Zembrich and um, singers of that caliber, uh, and the appearance of sing much more dramatic singers for the Verdi repertoire. In the early part of this century, it's quite true that no Mozart was given. But yes, before that, thought. it was. In the era of Graun Conrad, it was given all the time. Yes, well, the history of the fluctuations of Mozart's popularity is a fascinating one in itself. Uh, here's another one that has come from a great many of our listeners, and I hope that this erudite panel will do its best to enlighten those many listeners. When discussing a performance of a Mozart opera, someone is bound to comment that this or that singer did not have the Mozart style. And the question is, just what is Mozart style in singing? How does it differ from Wagnerian style or Italian or the Verdi style? Is it more or less difficult to attain? Mr. Goldowski? Uh, Mr. Dance, I think that 
what one normally reads about the Mozart style is purely an invention of reviewers who have nothing else to say. Uh, to us, Mozart style simply means fine performing, just as Verdi and Wagner style in that sense can mean fine performing. There are musical differences, but basically the vaunted Mozart style, I think, is just one way in which a man can hide the fact that he has nothing more substantial to say. <laughs> now, before I call on Mrs. Davenport, I should add that that question came to us from Mr. Gerald Levin of Akron, Ohio. Mrs. Davenport, did you want to add to the question of this I, singing style? I would only, uh, I, I don't disagree with uh, Mr. Goldowski, but the, uh, there is, uh, as he says, this is a fiction, this word Mozart style, but complete mastery of singing, the kind of singing which is the most difficult thing to do and without which nobody in his fundamental training shouldn't try to be a singer at all, is Mozart singing. You mean that Mozart singing is just the best singing, period? That's right. That's what we are. I think <laughs> Dr. Dr. Levery that. wants to add something. I remember in a, an interview that Miss Davenport conducted with Miss Milanoff about a month ago here on this program. The question was raised whether one should ever sacrifice good singing for expression. And Miss Milanoff very emphatically said no. Well, Mozart very emphatically also said no. Uh, he has written, he wrote about this extensively to his father. He said, music should never offend the ear. It should always please the hearer. And all the expression should come out of good singing. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Harrison. The problem with the, the, the question is that the word style itself is almost impossible to define. Yes. And so, I mean, you try to define a Wagner style or a Mozart style or a Berlioz style. Or it's like the word love. It only has one real meaning that means the same to everyone. Love is nothing in tennis. But you try to define it the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Goldowski? Well, musical styles obviously differ. Uh, Wagner is not the same as Mozart or Verdi. Uh, beautiful singing is necessary in Verdi, and I assure you that it takes just as much musicianship and lovely singing, uh, Ms. Davenport, and you know it better than I do, to sing Verdi as to sing Mozart. I would say maybe there's one difference. One has to sing Mozart possibly a bit less loudly than one sings the others. Ah, well, I'd, I would like to talk with you all about this afterward, because I'm sure there is a very, very vital matter of the we'll style put you on the panel in any of these <laughs> composers. <laughs> but I'm not on the panel. Let us go on to the next question. We all know that Richard Strauss was among the composers who particularly adored Mozart. E.H. Weiss of Silver Spring, Maryland, writes us that Strauss once said he would gladly trade any of his own operas for two bars, two specific bars of Mozart's Don Giovanni. Now, do you know, any of you by chance, which those two bars of today's opera were for which Strauss would have given any one of his masterpieces? And rightly so. Well, no. No. <laughs> well, then I have the music here at the piano and I'm going to ask Mr. Goldowski if he will go to the piano and play those two bars for us. Which You'll are, have to show them to me. I don't know what they I've are. I've marked them already in advance in the score. You'll find a great big red square around those two bars. And uh, perhaps I should explain before you play it that they are... <laughs> well, just a minute. Uh, this is what I was told on good authority. And that is the two bars that come between the end of Leporello's invitation to the three maskers to come to the ball, uh, his exit, and the famous mask trio, the, the three Avengers in masks, who take off their masks and say a prayer to heaven to, to uh, look kindly on their vengeance. And this is essentially, in other words, a period of transition, a quick transition from the ballroom music to the invocation to heaven. I think what Strauss is thinking of was the art of transition here. Well, this is the most commonplace thing in the world. Yeah, but not in that takes... context. I really think so? Yes. Goodness, I wouldn't give anything for those two. But this is the end of the menu words. Yeah. Now the strings play. Yes. And from now we'll be accompanied only by the winds, and this is supposed to be so wonderful. Well, it's a little slower. I think it's a little oh, wow. slower and a little... Uh, <laughs> too <measure. And>, uh, <laughs> good. Well, you have to take that up with the ghost of Strauss, Mr. Kodowski. <laughs> I'm afraid I that, think he was uh, just making it. I know exactly what he meant, and, and uh, while I wouldn't necessarily agree with him, I think that this is a, this is a, a is fabulously dexterous two measures. Strauss, I think, is the one who's doing the leg pull. <laughs> now, look, here's another one that involves Richard Strauss. This comes from Dr. J. Kurt Victorious of Greensboro, North Carolina. He quotes Strauss, and this is a particularly interesting one. 
since Strauss did have reservations. In a letter to Hofmannsthal, the librettist, as you know, of his Rosenkavalier, Richard Strauss wrote, I do not consider Mozart's so-called secco restative with piano accompaniment a very happy art form, and I'm beginning to take a greater and greater liking to spoken dialogue between the musical numbers, which seems to renew the freshness of the music. Now, the question is, do you, members of the panel, like these secco restatives, or do you agree with Strauss? Mrs. Davenport. I not only like the recitativo secco and everything that Mozart did exactly as he did it, but I wish Strauss had put his recommendation for spoken dialogue in place of some of the shrieks in Strauss. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Levery? I'm afraid musically there's very little to like about most recitatives. I think the way uh, Mozart arranged his operas, uh, I see it as a division of labor. The recitatives just favor the words and the music is quite unimportant. And I think in the arias exactly the opposite is true. I think we so can... I think we have to understand the words and, and, and the musical substance, with some exceptions, is negligible. Yes, I see some violent disagreements here, Mr. Oh. Harrison. No, I don't disagree at all. Uh, it's simply the, the point that he's overlooked entirely is that in Mozart, as in most composers who use secor recitative, the action takes place in the secor recitative and the arias freeze the action cold. The yeah. aria is about one thing and the recitative keeps the opera moving. You know, I think perhaps we ought to be careful to point out to the audience what is meant by secor recitative. Mr. Goldowski wants to comment anyway. Will you explain to us I'm, what I'm it... flowing over with uh, disagreement. <laughs> so I think... <laughs> explain to us first what it is. Well, first let me take violent disagreement with Mr. Harris. Mozart, Mozart, yes, indeed, that in Mozart's orchestrally accompanied pieces Certainly, the action does not freeze. It was one of Mozart's greatest geniuses, abilities, to move the action forward. Now, uh, a secco recitative is a recitative which is not accompanied by the orchestra, but by, by a piano or a harpsichord or whatever, a uh, keyboard instrument. Now, it is true that with most other composers, these recitatives tend to be nothing but empty formulas repeated just so that the action could move forward. But with Mozart, as with everything else he did, I think we all four will agree with that, anything this man touched turned to gold. And he was able to extract the most extraordinary bits of subtlety out of recitatives. May I go to the piano again? Good. No, no, can't have no time. No. Oh, that's a pity. All no right, time. Next well, time. Here's, here's, here's one question that we had doubts about using, but uh, the way our conversation has been going this afternoon, I think we really should use it. It comes from Sally A. Glass of Atlanta, Georgia, who writes, to prove that this Mozart quiz program is not designed just as a chorus of praise for Mozart, can the panel members honestly specify anything Mozart did wrong? No. Dr. Levering. No, <laughs> emphatically. <laughs> Mr. Golovsky. Emphatically, yes. He died much too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mrs. Davenport, did you... No, nobody can think of anything he did wrong. I couldn't possibly take exception to uh, anything he did. Finta <laughs> dal vino. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's to replace our usual Wagnerian chimes. And as you know, they mean that the ta time is just about up for today, unfortunately. But much better than that, the second act of Don Giovanni is about ready to begin. So thank you very much, Marsha Davenport, Boris Koldowski, Jay Harrison, and Sigmund Levery.